Thanks, Megan. It's uh, always a relief to take that mask off, isn't it? Thank you for sitting far enough away so that I don't have to wear it. <laughs> Not like you had any choice, right? They put the chairs all separated out. I am ready to get back to sitting right next to somebody, breathing their breath and them breathing mine. And it's a... It's going to be a great day. I can't wait. We all have something to look forward to. You know, there's some, <laughs> it's a, whew, this has been something. Well, let's, uh, let's go straight to the Lord in, in uh, reading of the scripture and prayer. And scripture today will be um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we um, think about prayer together for the next hour, I pray that you would um, create within us a desire for God that would Motivate us to pray. Lord, help us to learn how to do it best, how to do it most genuinely, how through doing it we can draw close to you in relationship and in submission and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's a pleasure to get to talk about prayer today and um, the question that we're asking today is, why pray? And um, in, in thinking about that, I, I did some reflection on um, certainly the most important human relationship in my life, and that's my, my relationship with Kathleen. I have had a bad case of Kathleen for 38 years. I mean a bad case. Uh, I, I guess I first met her about 40 years ago, and um, she, she kind of fascinated me from the start. Um, and, but we didn't really start uh, spending much time together for a couple of years, and we were in Spanish co- conversation class together in our third year in college, and uh, I just thought she was amazing. And it's, it's not, beca- it's not because... Um, She's the most beautiful woman in the world. That's not the case. Certainly the most beautiful woman in my world. But uh, it's not that she's objectively some raving beauty. I've always found her to to be attractive. But that wasn't it. It It wasn't just that. I mean, certainly that was part of it. But it was the way she handles herself. She has this amazing dignity that just draws me like a magnet. And I find on off days, like we've had, had this long weekend, I just find, you know, when I'm with her all day long, um, some, just some little thing all day long just draws me to her. I want to be where she is. Uh, I want her in my life. I want her in my world. Um, just the, her, her sense of taste, the things she does, the, uh, the things she's interested in, the things she's fascinated by, um, I just, it's a, mystery. it's a mystery. I'm not fully, I don't understand why I'm so um, besotted with her. <laughs> but I am. Been that way for now 38 years since we started dating. It was funny, back in the first, uh, she was clearly not interested in me. Now, I was drawn to her from the very get-go, but she was not interested but what we did in those days, if we didn't have anything to do in the evening, we were done studying, we'd go to the student union building, and there was always somebody playing games or doing something. And um, so usually she liked to play cards, and she played the game called Rook. And I'd, I'd played it as a child with my parents. and knew the game pretty well. I was a pretty good player. So I wound up playing Rook with her a lot. And... Uh, so we got to know each other more. And I remember one particular night I was walking her back to the dorm and uh, it was just obvious to me that I didn't need to ask her out. She was not interested in me. She confessed later that that was the truth. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I I'm, I'm, wasn't stupid enough to ask her out when I knew she wasn't interested in me. Um, so, time came. She, the, the end of that year, she went home. Uh, she had ran out of money and needed to earn some money and uh, had an internship at a radio station and at a television station back in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So, she, she went home, and I thought she was just gone. Didn't expect to see her again. But a year later, she came back to school, and um, I saw her in the bookstore. And I had not finished buying, getting my books yet, but she had finished getting hers, and she, she went and got in the line to check out. I, do they do, is there, do they, does that even exist anymore? I don't think it does. I mean, you go online, and you just buy it yourself. But in those days, you were, especially at the beginning of the year, there were these long lines to get through the bookstore. Um, and so the line was sufficiently long, and I, I, that gave me a few minutes to talk to her. So I, I went and got in the hot line right behind her. I figured I could come back and get the rest of my books later. And um, so we talked and talked and talked. And uh, finally, when, uh, when we had checked out, um, I said, um, well, if you don't mind, sometime I'll come by and page you. Now, the way that worked was the, the people lived in dormitories, and that was before there were cell phones or, you know, modern communications. And if you wanted to talk to a girl, you went to her dorm, and you asked them to page her. And, of course, then the whole floor where she lived knew there was a gentleman caller down there paging her, which is always a prestigious thing for uh, young women to experience. So she, she didn't, because it, it took some guts on a guy's part to go and page a girl that way. And so... Um, she came down, and uh, I went that very night. That very night I went, and I paged her. She came down. We took a walk and had a wonderful conversation, and I thought, wow, uh, this is going somewhere. So I kept asking her out. We went on several dates, and well, after a while, I realized that our communication styles were really different. Um, I talk all the time. I, I fill every moment with a torrent of words um, because I think out loud. It's just my nature, my cognitive style is to either talk or write what I'm thinking. Now, I can, I can think without talking or writing, but I think best when I'm talking or writing. And um, my, my, uh, my team here has, uh, actually the whole university has uh, had to try to learn that just because I'm saying something doesn't mean I'm committed to doing it or that I want you to do something. And uh, it's, a terrible, it's a terrible habit for a CEO to think out loud. Um, and it's, I've never been able to break it. It's who I am. I've, I'm a little better about it than I used to be, but I, I'm still, I mean, I've, I've learned as, as president, it's a, it's a handicap to always be thinking out loud. Because I'm a creative person, I come up with 10 good ideas and probably one of them is good enough to think about a little more. Most of them aren't that good. So people had to just kind of learn to listen to me process out loud. It's not, it's not the best way to be. Um, but it is how I am. And of course, in relationships, I talk, 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 talk. And I kind of like for the other person to tell me what they're thinking. But Kathleen does not operate that way. If she's got something to say and she's thought through it and she wants to say it, she will say it when she's good and ready. And what I learned about Kathleen real early was that sometimes you just have to sit peacefully with her and enjoy being together just because you're together and not fill every moment with words. But um, I'll tell you, I did not like her communication style at all. And I remember one of, after one of our first dates, I went back to the dormitory room and I went straight to the chapel and I just went in there and prayed and I said, God, I'm not calling that girl again. We can't talk. I mean, it's, it's like I can't communicate with her. She doesn't talk back. Uh, I just can't do this. And I remember the Lord speaking to me. I, I don't just say that lightly, but the Lord spoke to me and he said, you will call her back because this is a good thing. Or something like that. And uh, in, uh, when I left the prayer room, I went and called her. <laughs> we, talk, we had better talk on the phone than we'd had all night together. Um, and I tell you, it's been now, it's 38, it's almost 38 years of marriage. And uh, it, I just had to learn that she's not going to talk all the time. She's, she's going to talk when she needs to. However, 
If she does say something to me, she expects me to hear it. And that isn't always automatic because I tend to be, when I am concentrating on something, I, I have enormous powers of concentration. I mean, I can sit down and write 10 pages in an hour. I can really write fast because I, I, I really focus. I wrote one book in two weeks. I wrote my, my 300 page book in, in three months, including all the research time. Um, I wrote my dissertation in six weeks, my doctoral dissertation in six weeks. I can flat out write in a hurry when I sit down to write because I just go into this concentration mode that's total. <laughs> I once wrote through a, a tornado. A tornado hit my neighborhood when I was in Springfield, Missouri. I was upstairs writing away, right next to the window. And after I finished writing, I went outside and there was insulation all over the place where the tornado had blown through the neighborhood and destroyed these houses and spread their bits of them all over the neighborhood. I didn't even know. I was so engrossed in what I was doing that, that I didn't notice. Well, sometimes Kathleen will be ready to tell me something and she'll tell me and I'll go, huh? But I wasn't even listening. I didn't hear. And boy, that really ticks her off when she has told me something and I don't know what she said. So I've had to learn to un disengage when she comes and talks to me to try to disengage from whatever I'm thinking or doing and listen. Because when she speaks, she likes to be heard. I can tell you guys, uh, some, a lot of you guys that may be listening have wondered, how do you understand women? And the secret to understanding women is pay attention. It starts with that. That doesn't get you all the way there, but it starts there. Pay attention. Especially when she's saying something, listen. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's not easy for me to communicate with Kathleen, but, you know, I really am motivated to hear what she has to say and to know what she wants. Sometimes I have to kind of pull it out. I have to be paying enough attention to realize that she needs to tell me something and I need to kind of coax it out of her. And sometimes it's that I need to listen when she's ready to speak. It's, we just have really different communication styles. And um, I didn't think it would work there for a while, but it, it has. Um, but it's worth it. It's totally worth it because I want to be in a relationship with her. Now, I probably sound really weak the way I've described this, and, and it's not that way. Being with Kathleen empowers me, and she has been the most incredible helpmate to me in my whole life. I mean, she, she, she has made things possible. I mean, you look back through my whole life, everything I've ever wanted to do, Kathleen has made it possible. Uh, it's not like I'm some henpecked husband. It's not like I'm some weak person. But I'm empowered when I listen to her. She helps me. And it's a great thing. It's a great, great thing. And, you know, it's a lot like relating to God. Relating to Kathleen for me is a lot like relating to God. Um, in prayer, I can give God a big torrent of words. And, you know... Um, God may or may not respond. Just like Kathleen. <laughs> she, she, I can talk to her for an hour and she may or may not have anything to say about what I said. Um, it's the same way in prayer. God may or may not respond to your torrent of words. And prayer isn't primarily about unleashing a torrent of words on God. Although if you need to do that, that's perfectly fine. As the scripture told us, we can take our request to God. If we're concerned about something, we want to talk to God. God is there to listen and God will hear us. But that doesn't mean he's going to necessarily speak back to us in that moment. But when God does want to speak to us, we need to be paying attention. <laughs> and so it's a, you never know when God is going to speak to you. And so you need to be paying attention. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. Um, but prayer really does help us to adopt a posture in which we are ready to hear from God when he does call our attention. Making God, being aware of God's presence 
being attuned to God, being willing to hear. Prayer increases all of that. And so the question then is, why pray? We pray because prayer is the essential element of a personal relationship with God. Anybody that tells you they have a personal relationship with God who never prays is fooling themselves. Either they don't know what prayer is and don't realize that a lot of what they do is prayer, (laughs) or they're fooling themselves. But if you're going to have a personal relationship with God, prayer has to be part of it. Now, it's often said in evangelical circles particularly that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Now, that's a great slogan, but like most slogans, it's not really very deep. And while it tells a truth, it also falsifies the truth. Because Christianity is a religion, (laughs) and there's nothing wrong with it. As a matter of fact, prayer is the essential religious act, but it's also the essential relational act with God. If we're going to have a relationship with God, the only way to pursue that relation is through religious activities. That's the only way we actually can connect to God is through things that we would call religious activities. One of them is prayer. Another one is reading the scriptures. Another is going to church. There are other religious activities like getting married, which is a really good thing to do. Uh, There's dedicating a child. That's all religious activity. It's all good. It's all part of building a relationship with God. Religion and a relationship with God are not antithetical to each other. They belong together. And uh, that will become even more and more clear as we go through uh, the, the teaching today. But prayer is not what we mean to say by that phrase, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. What we mean to say by that is that Christianity is not some empty set of rites or activities we do to try to uh, get favor with God or gain brownie points with God or get God to do what we want him to or to try to uh, manipulate God. Prayer is not any of the, uh, religion isn't those things and Christianity isn't that. It's a sincere personal relationship with God that is pursued by religious practices. There, there is such a thing as dead religion. There is such a thing as empty religious rites. But most people who practice religion don't practice a dead religion and they don't practice empty rites. If it didn't mean anything to them, they wouldn't do it. Uh, there's certainly there's definitely been a tendency in, in, in evangelical Christianity to imagine that everybody else's religion was dead <laughs> because it looked different. It's not the case. <laughs> it just, just isn't the case. And uh, we, we need to not fall victim of a slogan and think that things are as simple as a slogan can make it seem. Uh, reality has depth. And Christianity has depth. And religion has depth. And we gain a deep relationship with God by practicing religious things like prayer. And so prayer... The, the, the notion of religion itself, uh, the, the, the word religion comes from a Latin word that means to bind. And religion is the practices that bind us to God. They're the things that tie us together with God. And the reason we pray is to bind ourselves to God. We pray in order to tie ourselves up in a relationship with God. When we get married, we say they're tying the knot. You've heard that, right? They're being tied together. Well, coming to faith is the first step. Accepting Jesus as your Savior is the first step of a personal relationship with God. But we need to continue tying those knots, continue binding ourselves to God, tying ourselves to God. That's what prayer is designed to do. And you can see that especially in the Lord's Prayer. When the disciples went to Jesus and they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. He gave them the Lord's Prayer. 
And I can guarantee you that it was not Jesus' intent in giving them the Lord's Prayer that it should just be something that they memorize and say ritually. Well, it certainly wasn't something meant to be a punishment for sin, you know, where you go to someone, you confess your sins, and they say, okay, because you've sinned, say 10 Our Fathers. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with saying 10 Our Fathers, and that maybe that helps. Uh, if that's your religion, that's great, do it. But it isn't, the Lord's Prayer was not intended as a penance. That's not what Jesus gave it to us for. Um, it's perfectly okay to, to do it, but it's not designed to be a penance. The Lord's Prayer is designed as a model for prayer that helps us to bind ourselves to God. And if you look at each of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, they uniquely connect us to God and put us in the right posture for our relationship with God to be tightened up and appropriately engaged. So let's look at those petitions quickly. The first petition of the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That petition, that request to God that his name should be kept as holy, that his name should be respected and honored and worshiped in the world, that request brings us to God in a posture of worship. What does worship mean? Worship means recognizing the worth of God. So when we go to God in worship in the Lord's Prayer, we recognize, first of all, that he is our Father. When we come to God recognizing him as Father, we are implicitly recognizing God as the authority who loves us. That's a powerful thing, that God is not just the Father who loves us, but the, the Father who has authority over us. And we come to God, we recognize who God is, he is our Father, and where he is. He is our Father in heaven. And recognizing that God is in heaven, we recognize that he stands enthroned above the world. He's above all things. He, is the high, he, is, he inhabits the highest place. God is above us. And we recognize that we are below God. And when we say, hallowed be thy name, we declare our desire not only that we should worship God and know who God is, but that the whole world should know God, should go, know God's excellence, should know God's love, should submit to God's authority, should hallow his name. And so the Lord's Prayer starts us off in this attitude and posture of worship, and that binds us to God, rightly. You know, to come to God without a spirit of worship, to come to God without recognition of who God is, is kind of a foolish thing. Um, but the Lord's Prayer sets us up. And the second petition of the Lord's Prayer takes it further. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, those two petitions are parallel to each other. They mean the same thing. When we say, let your kingdom come, we're saying that we want to see God's kingly rule established in all the world. What does that mean? It means that we've had it with the unfairness and the injustice and the cruelty and the evil that's in the world, and we want God's kingdom, we want God's rule to have ultimate authority in the world. Now, how does God's rule get expressed? It ex it's expressed when God's will is done. And so when we come to him, thy king, and we say, thy kingdom come, we express that we want the kingdom of God over all the world. When we say, thy will be done, we're stating that we want God to do his will in the world and also in us. It's like Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, before we come to God with our petitions, before we come to God suggesting the things we'd like for him to do for us, our first posture is recognizing who God is and therefore submitting ourselves to God's will. And I'll tell you the truth, there's, I'm always asking God for things, but there's one thing I want more than any other thing I ask, and that is I want God's perfect will to be done in my life. I've seen what that looks like. 
I have to know what it's like to be in God's perfect will. I know what it's like to be living in obedience to God. And it is the best life possible. It's the life I want to live. More than anything else, I want God's will to be done. And so praying that puts us in that proper position of submission to God. And then the third petition of the Lord's Prayer (laughs) says, give us this day our daily bread. When I say to God, give me my daily bread, I'm confessing to God that I can't even feed myself without him. (laughs) Have you thought about that? You can't even feed yourself without God? What is the most pathetic situation in all of human life? Somebody who can't feed themselves. You've all heard the the maxim, um, give a man a fish and he will eat today. Teach a man to fish, and he will eat every day. And (laughs) implicit in that old saying is the patheticness of somebody who doesn't know how to feed themselves. I mean, you can't stay alive unless you can feed yourself. I mean, it is an utter position of weakness to not be able to feed yourself. And the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, God, provide me my Daily bread. You know, daily bread. In Greek, it doesn't say daily there. It says epousia, and it means survival bread. Give me enough bread to survive, Lord. Don't let me starve to death. (laughs) Um, In praying such a thing, you're, you're recognizing that you don't even have a breath without God. You're recognizing your utter dependence upon God. Your life is not your own. Your efforts are not sufficient. You need God. That is a beautiful posture. If you want to be tied to God, if you want to be bound to God, it's a beautiful posture to recognize that you need him every hour. That you are never enough to to accomplish God's will for your life. I'm always asking God to let me do something I can't do myself. I want to be involved in things that require God to come help me. (laughs) And in fact, I don't know anything that doesn't. I need God. And recognizing that you need God is a tremendous act of humility. But God is pleased by it. When we recognize that we need God for our daily bread, we bind ourselves to God. And then the next petition says... Forgive us our debts, or forgive us our trespasses, or forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. When I come to God and I ask God to forgive me of my sins, I am recognizing that my life is morally compromised that I can't even be righteous on my own. The sin is always lurking and sometimes gaining advantage over me. Goodness, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a form of Christianity that believes that you can be completely sanctified in one experience and that after that you won't have the sinful nature anymore and you won't sin and you can live without ever sinning. I've tried it, but I can't quite get it. And I'm, I'm more of a Lutheran on this question. The Lutheran doctrine is simul justus et peccator. It means at the same time, justified and a sinner. I have found in the, mo- in the highest moments of my life, in the moments when I was doing the will of God in the, at the highest level, that I still haven't utterly eradicated sin from my heart and my mind and my life. I confess my sins to God every day because I am not not so sure of myself uh, that I would think I can live without sin. I think I can live with discipline. I think I can work to avoid sin But how do I defeat pride that's always lurking? How how do I defeat 
ego that's always there to push my, push my own concerns to the front. Um, I don't believe I can live a life of Christian perfection, but I'm determined to strive for it. And so, when I come to God in prayer, I recognize how I've failed. And that helps me to live in a constant state of knowledge that God has forgiven me, that God has declared me just in his sight, that I am standing before God purely by his grace and not by my achievement, not by my works, that I stand before God thoroughly accepted by God. And I'll tell you, knowing that God loves me in all of my failures and all of my faults, knowing that God has called this sinner justified in his eyes, that binds me to God. And so we pray, forgive us our sins, but we then pray as we forgive others, those who have sinned against us. Forgiving others and recognizing that my own guilt requires me to forgive others is really, it's taking that humility of, of uh, repentance to the next level. It's recognizing that I don't have the right to hold someone else's sins against them because I've, I've hurt people too. I've failed people too. Having that humility I tell you, sometimes when people have really hurt you, the last thing you want to do is set them loose from it. The last thing you want to do is forgive them. But it's good to do it. It's good to do it. It doesn't mean you have to sit around and let them keep hurting you. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you've got to accept the abuse. Sometimes you forgive people and get as far away from them as you can. But by forgiving them, you set yourself free from the hurt they've done to you and you heal. Until you forgive them, you can't. You can never really get over what they've done until you loose them from it and stop hating them and stop resenting them and kick them out of your life that way. Forgiveness is essential to our relationship to God because when we're continuing to hold uh, someone in guilt, when we're continuing to hold a grudge against someone, when we're continuing to allow someone to hurt us, it disturbs our relationship with God and we've got to let it go. And to do that, to, to forgive other people, it recognizes that we essentially and inherently live together in community. You know, we evangelicals are really into an individual salvation. And it's true. We get saved one at a time. When we come to God in faith, we come and we receive Christ as our Savior, we individually enter into salvation. But the minute we do it, we become part of the church. You don't live for God alone. Christianity is a team sport. Christianity is lived out in community. You don't come to Jesus in order to be saved alone. You come to Jesus in order to be saved together with the church. Together, all of us will be one bride of Christ. We will be together for eternity in, in heaven with God. Being saved means being part of the church. It means being part of a community. I wrote on my Facebook page yesterday something like... Um, we, we go to heaven together, but everyone goes to perdition alone. <laughs> the uh, French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre was also a playwright, and he wrote a play called No Exit. And in that play, he makes one of the most striking statements of the 20th century. It's really an essentially existential statement. And when he says, hell is other people. Sartre thought hell was other people because other people are constantly impinging on your decisions and trying to get you to do things their way and not letting you do it your way. I understand that President Trump left the White House today to the music, I did it my way. Well, I guess he did. Boy, he left alone. <laughs> 
There's a price to be paid for always doing it your way. And it usually means alienation from others. Um, Hell is not other people. Hell is the ultimate experience of being alone. Heaven is about being a part of of the beloved community that Jesus has saved. And in heaven, you'll never be alone, ever. And in this world, in the Christian life, you are never alone. And perhaps that's the reason why the Lord's Prayer is not designed for solo prayer. You can pray it all alone, but you can't pray it without recognizing the community around you. Every one of the petitions is plural. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even that one, though it doesn't say we or our, it recognizes that we're part of a society, part of a kingdom. It goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord's Prayer is designed for community. It's a, it's a prayer in community. Whether we all say it together at once or whether we pray it individually, there is a recognition that we pray as a community, that we live for God as a community, that we relate to Jesus both individually and as a community. And so prayer doesn't just bind us to God. Prayer binds us to each other. That final petition of the Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is a recognition that evil is always lurking, that we're always vulnerable, and that we need God's help. We need God's protection. In all of those aspects of prayer we're being bound to God in relationship it's the essential relational act of the Christian and when we do it when we live a life of prayer the peace of God that passes all understanding guards our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus There are many ways of prayer, many forms of prayer, and they're all good. You know, in my own life, I pray in the mornings, I pray at night. Um, But in the last three months, I've been doing something which I've done periodically over the years, but um, especially in the last three months, I've had just felt compelled to pray. Um, And so for the last three months, I've had my clock set at the 59th minute, my, wa- my, my cell phone, is go- it dings me every hour at the 59th minute. I, I've got it set to play a soft little prayer, little prayer song so that it doesn't surprise me. I used to have it set on alarm, and then, <laughs> you know, it, it, it would alarm me every hour, and I don't think prayer isn't really about alarm. <laughs> and so I put a little softer music behind it. But um, every hour at the 59th minute, it alarms me to pray. And uh, I have a list of people that I'm praying for at any given moment. And right now, it's uh, Jared is right there at the top of my list. Uh, Phil's son-in-law, his his situation um, uh, concerns me deeply. I I want to see that young man healed and live a long life and to play out his incredible talent for ministry, to see his dreams fulfilled. I want him to spend years and years with his wife and and to know the joy of, of, of serving God in this world for many more years to come. For him to die and go to heaven would be gain in some way, but I want him here. <laughs> I, want his, I want his influence in the world. So I pray for him every hour, and he's, he's been where he needed it every hour. And thank God we've just had a great report where uh, he's in remission again from his cancer, and I'm, I'm praying that it'll never come back on him again. But... Um, there's, right now, there's about 10 people that I'm praying for every hour, and I'll, I'll pray for them, and then I will just recognize God's presence with me and move on with the rest of my day. It only takes a minute, 
What do you, you might think, what good does it do to pray for one minute? Well, it focuses, it focuses me on God that, for that minute. And you know, I've, I've, it's fallen into a habit so that now about every 55th minute, I'm thinking, is it time to pray? <laughs> but throughout the day, that one minute of prayer on the hour reminds me of God's presence. It reminds me that God's there. It affects the whole hour, not just the one minute. And... Um, I imagine a time will come pretty soon when I will um, go back to not having the prayer alarm go off every minute, every hour, but, but it'll still, still through the day, I'll be reminded, my, my mind will go back to God through the day. We want to train ourselves to pray without ceasing. We want to train ourselves that when our mind is not focused on something else, it returns to thinking about the Lord. And even when we are concentrating on something else, we've developed a habit of allowing God to interrupt us. Just like when I'm writing or thinking about something or involved in something, and Kathleen comes and wants to tell me something, I've learned that I need to disengage from what I'm doing and listen to her because she's telling me something important. She wouldn't be speaking unless it was important. <laughs> um, just as I've learned to stop it and listen, you can learn to hear God's voice even when you weren't expecting it because you've learned to be attentive to him. I urge you this semester to listen carefully, to attend all the chapels on prayer, to hear the, the different perspectives that you'll get from the different ones who teach. Everyone's got a different angle because we're all so different. This is the way I look at it. It's good to have a longer time of prayer and it's important to me. But build prayer into your day. When you wake up in the morning, build the habit that your, your mind goes to God first. The, that God is the first thing your mind goes to when you wake up. You can do that. Even if it's just a little prayer alarm that's set to a worship song that sets your mind towards the Lord. Start in the first thing in the morning, recognizing God. When you have your meals, take time to pray before you have your meal. At the end of the day, Take time to pray. That's going to make sure that at least five times a day, your mind is turning to God. And, um, and build in the habit of finding God in prayer. You're going to build a relationship. You're going to bind yourself to God. And it's going to give you peace. Let's pray. If you would, let's pray together the words that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And let the peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in chapel today. Thank you for watching on, uh, on, on, on the internet. <laughs>